You ready? Let me make sure I get everyone's names right. How to say my name? Yeah. Apollonia. Is that me? Is that Nia? Uh -huh. Is it Nia? Apollo Nia. It's like the Greek god Apollo. There's two L's. Excuse me. Okay. It's okay. In Bracken, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick off. Um, so before we start, uh, we acknowledge that we gather upon the lands of the Cherokee, Muskogee Creek, Osage, but also, I'm sorry, that was, I read over the commas and the ands. We acknowledge that we gather upon the lands of the Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, and Osage, but also the many Indian nations that called this their home in the generations before forced removal. We respect their hospitality and honor their histories. Uh, so my name is Bracken Clark. Uh, welcome to a real, the Real Talk series. This is our uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Native Amer or Thanksgiving as Native Genocide Day. Um, so we'll be discussing uh, Native American issues, past and present, and we'll end up talking about how, uh, or what a vibrant Native future looks like and how we can support Natives in their efforts to see that through to the end. Um, right. Oh, this is, a, this is a joint, or this is a collaborative effort between the Tri-City Collective, Phil Brook Museum, the Woody Guthrie Center, Folk Alliance International, uh, the Black Wall Street Times, um, I think that, oh, and the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. So we thank them for their help as well. So just to start off with a little history, would you guys sort of give us a brief, because I want to spend most time on like current issues and how to build a better future or uh, ensure a, a bright future. Sort of a brief overview that leads us to why Thanksgiving is problematic in the American, sort of the United States and observance of it. Do you want to take the lead on that one at the moment? No? Yeah. Oh, because we're matriarchal trans. That's right. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for honoring that. Um, he's just going to agree with everything I say. That's the plan. So, Thanksgiving as we know it right now is. Uh, problematic or at least, it, you know, I can say that it's gotten better in the past few years, but you know, like how maybe me, how you grew up, how most of us grew up in here. Um, I remember being in first grade and doing uh, pilgrims and Indians and having to guess which one the teacher made me be. <laughs> with, yeah. um, with the uh, construction paper, feather, hat, you know, or band or whatever it is. Um, it's problematic because that's not actually what Thanksgiving is here in America. Um, Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War is when he made it officially a holiday as a means of trying to start reconciliation between the North and the South. Um, and and but that's not you know there's like this narrative of uh, Thanksgiving happened and it was like this joining of the pilgrims and the Indians uh, back east um, but there was actually a, a, a I believe it was a Massachusetts governor who celebrated the celebration of Thanksgiving because he massacred a bunch of Pequot Indians and that is kind of like one of the origins of back east of what Thanksgiving is. They were giving thanks because they had surrounded this Pequot village and then just completely massacred everybody inside. They don't tell that story in school though. Oh, I guess we should introduce ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, uh, the host had to cancel yesterday last minute for health reasons and our additional panelists had to cancel for personal family reasons. So I'm stepping in as host, so I'm not as prepared as I should be or could be had I known earlier. So please excuse my um, poor note taking and poor order of events here. I'm Bracken Clark, I'm with the Tri-City Collective. I'm a librarian until very recently. Well, I have the librarian degree, so I'll always be a librarian. Um, but now I work at TPS, the Education Service Center. And I'll let you go first because I'm observing your matrilineal power. Oh boy. Apollonia Pinia, Chahajifkodos, Idrogi Omalegridos, Dalahasu Wagagay Almidovados. My name is Apollonia, 
Uh, I'm from here, I'm from Tulsa. I'm Muskogee and Chicana. And my background is, uh, I have a background in math and science, uh, particularly from uh, indigenous lens where I try to research and engage in math and science uh, kind of through decolonizing the practice, decentering it from Western European only praxis. I am involved in a few nonprofits. I am involved with Matriarch. I am involved with Thick Descriptions, which seeks to promote brown people in the STEM fields. Um, what is the other nonprofit I'm involved? Oh yeah, the Anti Project. Uh, that was a nonprofit that we uh, came up with a few months ago to help the um, also indigenous migrant kids that are in the borders that Trump has created. And so we started that to keep an eye and kind of be a watchdog for those uh, children that are dying in the concentration camps at the border. And we've had a lot of success with that. So that's a bit of my background. Uh, I also am an interdisciplinary researcher. I'm currently working on a podcast right now with a fellow collaborator. Um, concerning Creek history and Charles Page, um, we should have a pilot out by the end of the year. And I also have, thanks, just wait for that to drop. <laughs> uh, we've uncovered a lot of history that has not been told in Oklahoma, and I can't wait for that to get out. Um, and there's also a book that I helped co-research for called uh, The Great Swindle, Race, Religion, and Lies, and Why Oklahoma is the Weirdest State in the Union. That also concerns a lot of Oklahoma, or excuse me, Creek, Muskogee history. Uh, that will be out sometime in January. Um, so I'm proud that I was able to like kind of do the Native American cultural competency fact checking on that. But that'll be a good one. I've never seen an Oklahoma history book written in the way. And uh, it was a white academic who wrote it. And he's like the best type of white academic you could hope for. Because when I offered suggestions, he didn't fight with me. He was just like, explain it to me. Oh, I see that. Done. So there's good white academics out there. Trick, so it's Jeffel. Oklahoma, Shibalaya, Siwoki. I'm. I, I'm trying to move back that uh, the Choctaw districts, we had three bands originally in Oklahoma, and uh, unfortunately a lot of my tribe's forgotten that. We were just discussing matrilineal, and so the tribal town identity among the Choctaws is not as strong as it is among the, uh, um, among the Muscogee. Uh, of the original 44 tribal towns that were in the Muscogee, I think there's 18 that are still active. Yes, about 18. And so... Um, and there's even f uh, fewer of the tribal towns that are active among the among uh, my my tribe. Uh, I have worked uh, in education for quite a while. Uh, when I did my dissertation, my dissertation was on uh, the inter the interconnection between. Uh, I just come up come out and say it is. I was forced towards a postcolonial lens, and that postcolonial lens uh, uh, had me identify hegemony as uh, what I call Pocahontism. It's basically it's from Stedman, uh, who had uh, developed uh, this book called Shadows of the Indian, where he was talking about La Belle Sauvage, uh, about uh, this need to, uh, essentially, Europeans were trying to create a, a, a standard whereby um, the Indian female uh, becomes part of her, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the term is called, I just slipped my mind. Uh, long story short, once she is married, her property becomes property of the state. And so that is repeated throughout. As, uh, and so I, I, I use that as a center point in my dissertation dealing with hegemony, mainly because I pivoted it off the fact that uh, uh, the Choctaws had 124 schools, uh, educational, you know, uh, bi, um, bi, uh, bilingual schools that taught English and uh, Choctaw. Cherokee had 124 schools. The Creeks had 70. And the most significant Creek school, obviously, in this town was Henry Kendall College, which eventually became Tulsa University. Even Tulsa University on its own website doesn't acknowledge that at this time, which is really disappointing. Uh, 
Uh, it's like Southeastern State not acknowledging that Choctaw Presbyterian was its focus where it started and like Northeastern State. As a matter of fact, one of those, uh, one of the areas when I was uh, at the Center for Tribal Studies uh, doing my undergraduate in the 90s at Tahlequah, I, I was, we called it uh, the, the Center for Tribal Studies, but we, were, we called ourselves Indian University Scholars. And what we were interested in is uh, why did the state never name it Cherokee State University? And why did the state never name Southeastern Choctaw State University? And why did Tulsa University not name itself Muskogee State University? You know, so you start dealing with those intricacies and you start dealing with uh, the hegemony that's within education itself. And especially the, uh, when you deal with statehood in 1907 and the takeover of our educational systems, uh, we literally had to give those to the state. So those 70 schools that belong to the Creeks, the 124 schools that belong to the Choctaws, not to mention our colleges, were given to the state outright by Senator Owen, who claimed to be Cherokee from Virginia. And then I took the other side of that as the, um, uh, I also went with Stedman. Uh, he calls it uh, Man Friday. Uh, I called it Tontoism. As you know, Tonto in, uh, in Spanish means stupid, okay? And so uh, I, I, I chose, I called the subaltern, uh, the one that cannot speak, I called him Tontoism. And so I define education within the parameters of the hegemonic uh, uh, expectation that history will always be interpreted uh, from, uh, from a, a dominant culture standpoint. Um, there's Melissa Harjo. Hishte. All right. Uh, long story short, as we start dealing with uh, what she was talking about on history, uh, I put together my own curriculum that I introduced in Tulsa Public Schools. Uh, I'm just now able to finally get the land run portion of that into the third grade. I was on the, I was on the uh, uh, committee that was doing the redesign on the social studies academic uh, for the state. We made some inputs. I think some of my inputs were, uh, uh, were, were heard, but uh, Ultimately, even in that process, dealing with the state of uh, the, the state department on uh, revising those social study standards, you, you end up in a situation where you're having conversations with. Uh, since we're just a small percentage, we end up having conversations that sound like we're being antagonistic against specific guidelines, and it, it's not that um, we're being necessarily being antagonistic. What we're saying is, is can we be a little bit more expansive, and um, be a little bit more accurate with those, with those. Uh, and so I was very happy that they separated out the segment that uh, the one uh, third grade uh, 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 social studies curriculum that says now that the Native American perspective has to be taught as well as the, um, uh, uh, as well as the, the standard state of Oklahoma uh, message on, on uh, the land run issue. And so at least that's encapsulated. You know, and so uh, there was an, I was on a committee that was trying to get sovereignty, uh, sovereignty curriculum introduced uh, uh, within the state. It, I, it has, you know, stalled quite a few times. So as we, where I'm gonna be coming from tonight, uh, Apollonia will, uh, I will be in agreement with her. I'm not going to argue with her, but on the educational side of it, uh, I'm, I'm going to specifically address those areas that I think that are uh, severely negligent within our curriculum. Uh, because ultimately when you're talking about uh, uh, Thanksgiving, it, you're untying it from a larger mythos, a myth that uh, many people in this country take very sacred, they identify with. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we recently had a, uh, I'll just come out and say it, uh, uh, we had a red face incident uh, from a, a colleague, we found, we discovered it. Uh, person was dressed as Pocahontas and, and, and called themselves that. And, and then in the defense of that, the person, uh, is the first thing they said, which is typical in Oklahoma, is that, you know, they respected, uh, they respect their culture because, uh, and then they claim uh, Cherokee descendancy. Well, that automatically puts you in, that automatically puts you into a historical problem because uh, Pocahontas uh, was Renape, which is kind of the Lenape, which means that they, you know, is not the same thing as, as the Jalagi, uh, you know, the Jalagi people. And so automatically, whenever you start dealing with these issues, you start untying myths and you start dealing with, with deep-seated uh, intertwining between that and faith. Uh, 
uh, that, that, is, that has created the American experience. And that faith issue uh, will always come into, in, into uh, some kind of collision in, in, within academics. Well, you don't want to taint the image of American exceptionalism. There we go. I was going to ask, like, so Thanksgiving is also looked, or is often looked at as like America's a religious holiday where Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, Hindus, everybody can come together and celebrate this holiday w without like religious interference. So I think that plays into the like United Statesian hold of this holiday. Uh, would you guys talk about the, um, how you said that it, you're not looking to attack or push into something that you, you don't want to take something apart, you want to make it more expansive and in, uh, in, inclusive and truthful. Would you speak to that in uh, the Thanksgiving observance in America as we sort of do it today? I like how you do it. Just what? You first. I go first. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, I guess Thanksgiving is seen as kind of like this um, agnostic holiday. And uh, just full disclosure too, I know this may be like antithetical to the panel, but it's actually one of my favorite holidays. <laughs> um, but not for the reasons that you may think. I used to do for a number of years, um, for really the past 10 years, me and my friends, we get together and do an anti-colonial Thanksgiving. And we're, we would cook, um, it would be kind of like a huge potluck and for a lot of people in my circles, they don't necessarily have the best um, home lives, family structures, and so it was a place where they could all come and congregate, right? And it was this overlap of like my like white hipster friends, middle class friends, and then all my like rugged resi Indian friends and everybody is cooking something, you know, uh, from their culture, from their family. And so it became this cool conglomeration of where, uh, particularly for a lot of my indigenous friends, they would intentionally cook foods indigenous to their tribe. And we would share that. And we would always have wine, uh, always a fire. And I think you've been to these, Maddie. And, um, in scary stories, always. You can't have an Indian gathering without telling ghost honka stories. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that different conversation, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, and so we just kind of, much like how minority people do, we take something from the popular culture, right, and we turn it and create it and morph it into something of our own that works for us. Um, so I can't even remember your original, hold on. Um, <laughs> I think you're speaking to it. You're speaking to like, I think the idea that United Statesians have about Thanksgiving is that people from different cultures come together and share. So by observing it in a, in a more real truthful way, a more expansive way where the idea is not trying to destroy or take down Thanksgiving, it's trying to make it practice what it says it's doing. Right, and so that's like part of the reason why I always try to have like that fire. Like that's always a consistent element. We have a fire in the backyard, maybe illegally because we're technically in city limits, but whatever, hashtag sovereignty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of where we, where we do sit around and we tell stories and we, inevitably it always does come up this discussion particularly between my non-native friends and my native friends that are always there overlapping these circles of origin stories various origin stories of course of Thanksgiving and how it's such a false narrative um, and how so many things that are taught particularly in a conservative state like Oklahoma in Oklahoma history it's just not it's not factual, it's not truthful. We get like one paragraph talking about forced removal. It's gotten a little bit better over the years, but it's not nearly on the level that it should be. Uh, you know, talking about um, the land run, boomers and Sooners. So that's kind of what we've turned Thanksgiving into, at least for my household. Um, taking something that was false, um, not truthful, so very American, um, 
very capitalist, and you make it work for you. Yeah, so on the high school side of that and dealing with Thanksgiving, uh, as, she, as she mentioned, uh, to prepare for this, I made sure that I, I got to make sure I got it right. I, watched, I made myself watch Disney's Squanto and American Tale again. <laughs> I was like, God bless you. You really put like, in the word. I was like, Oh my goodness! I'm going to watch this, and I'm going to follow the narrative on it. Uh, uh, and it absolutely avoided the one subject that is avoided within the um, American history textbooks, and that is the very first slaves taken in this country were Native American, not African American. It was Native Americans, and uh, specifically to Squantum was a little boy, and he was kidnapped. He was one of the, he, he was kidnapped and uh, there was an attempt to sell him into slavery into Spain. He escaped there, made it to England, and then that's where he learned English. Now, the reason that this becomes important is because uh, before the triangle trade, the slave trade started, and we have to remember that it actually originated on, in, on this continent, especially when you start dealing with um, the, Span, uh, the Spanish um, conquistadors and you start dealing with those issues of uh, encomienda and requirimiento and those those policies that existed uh, that came out of feudalism out of Spain, you know, creating serfs again. And the serf class obviously was going to be the native class that was going to serve uh, those communities. So I watched Disney's <laughs> Squanto. It shows him being kidnapped. It does show that. It shows him uh, fighting a bear and then there's this wonderful moment in it. I just, uh, I howled after I, after I got angry. But then I howled, went back and watched it. And this is, uh, he does like that crocodile Dundee thing and calms down a bear that they, they put him in a bear baiting thing. Disney did. And he's like, oh, my. And I was, <laughs> I was Noble like, savage trope. There, there we go. And so uh, in dealing with that, uh, you know, one of, one of those areas that we never get back to is like, uh, yeah, it, was, it was recently, it was in the uh, Washington Post uh, where they discussed uh, that all Negro and Indian slaves that are let out to be hired would be hired at the market house at the Wall Street Slip. We forget of the Native American slavery and the connection to Wall Street and that divorce between uh, that Dutch wall that was there as part of the fort and the exchange that went on between those tribes and the set. And so ultimately, the reason that becomes important to me is because that leads into the 1712 Yamasee War, which uh, where, uh, North, where South Carolina, by the way, South Carolina, and this is where I, I was talking about earlier, I cross, I'll just jump centuries because I see the connection. Uh, but South Carolina uh, is where the Indian slave trade originated, and people don't realize that. And so they were hiring, uh, they were trying to hire some of the upper creeks and the lower creeks. The lower creeks were attacking, I guess, the Yamasee, and some of those tribes south that are ne next to the Miccosukee. Uh, the Yuchi were also involved in that, were hired by some of them. Uh, Virginia was hiring Jalagi, the over hills, and they were attacking creeks. Uh, some of the Alabama, I guess, were, were hired and were attacking Choctaw. Choctaw were capturing Chickasaws. Chickasaws were working for British. And you start dealing with this intertribal warfare. And one of the problems that you don't deal with in the, in the tribal by divorcing that part of history of Thanksgiving from the slave trade, you don't, you never get a full picture of the fact that what all these tribes were responding to was clan law. Every one of these tribes would have had a clan law, which says if, you know, it, clan law just simply is, is if someone from your clan is kidnapped or killed, that clan has an obligation to provide justice for that lost soul. And so, all of a sudden, you know, the United States or, or, or Britain cast the Indian as the savage because the response was immediate. It was non, it was not merciful in a lot of stands. And, but it was also very, uh, very, very much, uh, how can I, I'm trying to look for the right uh, metaphor. Europeans don't have a problem with Spartacus. It's on Netflix now, right? Okay, and so this whole Roman idea of Roman society, one third of them being slaves. So when those slaves rise up and start to destroy Rome, 
the United States uses that as a metaphor against, you know, uh, fighting against the, the kingdoms, correct? This, this concept. But when Indians rise up in the Yamasee, when the Creeks and the Choctaws and the Cherokees join in an alliance to destroy South Carolina, that's somehow missing out of the textbook. That those people that were being taken as slaves said no and started getting guns from the French and decided we were going to wipe out South Carolina. Which, by the way, interestingly, no one ever does this connection either. It's not even any side notes. But Calhoun, in 1824, who designed the Bureau of Indian Affairs in, within the Department of Army, is from South Carolina. And his grandmother was killed during one of the raids that was probably initiated by Dragon Canoe, the Cherokee. So this warfare between Indians and South Carolina kept pro propelling through history. And so the Creeks' uh, alliance with the Choctaws, at one time there was a proposal by France to ally the, the Alabama and the Choctaws during the, during the French and Indian War. Had that happened, had they been successful at that, you know, it probably would have changed uh, at least the, the color of the United States even further. It would have become more, more French, possibly. But my point being, where I'm headed with this is, is that part of it is just completely taken out of the history books. And so you have the, the savage metaphor, but you don't have the background behind it, and that is clan law. You kidnap a kid, you, you know, uh, I, I look at the 800 Choctaws that were taken, either by Cherokee or Chickasaws, and then you're like, this explains why there was so much warfare between the five tribes and why there wasn't an initial unity. And so then you're able to piece that together. And then it, then it explains, well, why all those tribes ended up joining Britain uh, during, during the Revolutionary War, especially uh, the Creek Andrew McGilvery. You know, his, he was Scottish and he was, uh, he was Alabama. And so then you're like, oh, that's how come he joined the Choctaws at Pensacola uh, against, against Spain, you know, on the side of Britain. And uh, so where I, where, I, where I start the conversation in uh, my, when I used to teach it Native American history, is the uh, gorget. The gorget is the absolute perfect example of American history. And the reason that is is because that gorget is a leftover, the, the British adopted that for their officers. It's what's left over for the neck plate uh, of, from the uh, days of the knights, okay? So the remnant of the armor that the knights wore in service of the king during feudalism, the remnant is that neck plate. Okay? And so they would wear it, and so they gave it to our chiefs and cre created metal chiefs. What they were in, in essence doing, what the Europeans were doing, was creating a feudal structure in the United States. And the Indians were to, were to serve that, that, uh, that monarchy, be it France, be it England. And so as a result of that, I think you know, one of the things I, when we're talking about genocide is I also recognize the power of our tribes. The Creeks were massive, the Choctaws were massive, the Cherokees had 100 towns, Choctaws had 100 towns. Uh, the Creeks, had they allied themselves more with their Miccosukee brothers, would have had probably 150. You know, there's 80 of them we know that were in, in Georgia and Alabama. But had they allied themselves with their Miccosukee cousins down south, they probably would have been the largest. And so you look at these alliances and, and these tribes, because they're, of their interaction and trade and their, and their complexity, uh, clan mothers, you know, the clan mother's son, oldest son, becomes the next Miko, becomes the next leader, you know, and then her oldest daughter becomes the next clan mother, and so that oldest son, the nephew, becomes the next leader. You know, that system, that structure was dealing with a feudal structure from Europe. And by the way, uh, the reason I started there, if you've ever read Wooster versus Georgia or any of those earlier uh, Supreme Court cases, they talk about Sazen and Fee. And then they also talk about wards that were wards. They were putting the original relationship of the Cherokee into a feudal structure, the United States was, that, that we gave our fealty to, these, to, the, to those crowns and therefore uh, we got to exist side by side with states. And so that feudal structure becomes controlling in that and so history becomes very important and specifically the Indian slave trade becomes critical in understanding the development of Thanksgiving and where we're headed. By the way, I kept, I kept notes that way. Stay on. <laughs> so, 
So let's step back a little bit and talk about um, another sort of popular misconception, uh, Columbus Day and Columbus's discovery of America. I think that's gotten a lot better and a lot more deeply explored and a bit closer to the truth than it was when I was young, but there's still a lot of misconception and myth and mythos and sort of American institutional longing and honoring and sort of holding close to this idea of civilization coming to the Americas. Um, could you talk about more of what Columbus brought to America in, 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 in truth instead of the myth? Well, for the thing, you know, me having my background in science and, and medicine, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is syphilis. Um, <laughs> he definitely, uh, we have him to thank for bringing, you know, like often Native people get portrayed as like these savage, dirty people running around half naked in leather and fur. Um, that isn't accurate, uh, particularly for Muscogee people. We bathed each morning um, facing east. That's when we bathed, um, and we said a prayer every morning as we washed ourselves. Um, we were actually quite disgusted with the white settlers because they smelled so bad to us because of their lack of hygiene. So, sorry, going on a thing there. Yeah. Diseases uh, is what Columbus brought, syphilis, STIs. Um, another thing, memory that is actually just coming to mind immediately is when I was in undergrad and having to take a forced humanities course. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I know, I know, this guy. Um, so uh, getting into an argument with my humanities professor um, where, it was a bit histrionic, where he was talking about these mythos of Columbus and how he came over uh, to America, he discovered America, of which I just started laughing hysterically in class, nobody else did. Um, and then it got somewhat confrontational between us um, where I just said, you can't discover a continent where people have been living for thousands of years. We've already had our civilization. Like we have this intricate roadway structure where we communicated across America. That doesn't get talked about. We had Cahokia. Um, we had a lot of things, and so I was just like, I'm sorry, but like he never actually even stepped foot in America. He was lost. It was by accident. He even ended up over here. You, you just simply can't discover people that have been living and existing for thousands of years. And he just started yelling at me and pointing his finger, at which point I just grabbed my bag and I just left class. And all the white students were like, what just happened? <laughs> so... Yeah, um, it is, I feel like I'm like the optimistic one here. I, I keep saying this. In America, it is getting better because you see more and more cities doing away with Columbus Day and this like that false narrative that he discovered America. Uh, he didn't. And I think the people that it affects the most are probably um, these diehard um, Italian Americans that really want to bolster and keep this idea of Christopher Columbus. Um, so it, it, there is more positive change happening in that direction where people understand that's just not, it's not the totality of the story. You can't discover a civilization that's been here. Columbus Day. Uh, I was at uh, the protest in 1992 at the state capitol. Uh, my buddy had, uh, had worked with, uh, I think it was Gloria, I, I can't remember her last name. Uh, Talia Redcorn had said, hey, let's go up there to that. And so I said, okay, then we'll go. Uh, I just threw your name in here, Tolly. You may not want to be associated with me. <laughs> but uh, uh, we were there, and one of the things that, that um, became apparent uh, in the year of the Indian, 1992, was that uh, uh, 
the conversation had started up again on Columbus Day as to, as to what it was, but um, being positive, as she said, I mean, we have come quite a way since 1992 even, uh, when we first started addressing that. Because uh, anytime, you're, anytime you're a revisionist on history, you know, you have to, you, there's, there's, quite a, there's quite a pushback. Uh, when I was going to talk about a while ago, was, uh, the deer, when I was, I, the reason Columbus Day comes into this is because you, you start dealing with the economic models. He was looking for gold, okay? Conquistadors were looking for gold. Everyone's always looking for gold. Virginia was started looking for gold. I mean, that's what it's stated in their charter. We're looking for gold. Someone's always looking for gold. Uh, and so everyone watched The Revenant. Has everyone seen The Revenant? Okay. Uh, dealing with the deer trade. You know, in 1707, 121,000 uh, deer furs were traded with South Carolina. And then in 1699, but by 1714, it dipped to 50,000 because of the, inter the war between South Carolina and the tribes I was talking about earlier. The reason I talk about that is because all of a sudden, uh, South Carolina provided a way to, to cancel the debt that the Creeks and the Yamasee and all these tribes had. What they would trade is guns, pots, pans to those tribes. Those tribes would trade uh, deer, uh, deer skin in, in exchange for that. And then in 1699, they passed the law that says one Native American slave will, uh, will equal 200 deer skin. So the economics, the economics between the United States, Thanksgiving, Columbus Day, and, and tribal subjugation is still here. I mean, look at it. We're having to renegotiate uh, on this gaming compact. You know, I hate tying something in the past to current but it's always something economic when you're dealing with, with tribes. You know, uh, the Choctaws were sitting on a lot of, you know, statehood. The one thing that would they, we ignore is that the Choctaws were sitting on a lot of uh, coal during the time of the railroads, when that becomes very price, uh, becomes very valuable. Uh, and then for some reason, uh, I'll, I'll blame the Jalagi, I'll blame the Cherokee, because they didn't allow that one well to be drilled by Bartlesville. But then uh, uh, this one doctor marries a Creek woman and, and they allows drilling over here uh, at, what is it, Red, Red, I can't even remember what the Red Town is called over here, but it's right next to Tulsa. Long story short, uh, we end up with the, um, we end up with the discovery of oil in, in Oklahoma. No, the one that's right over here, right across, Red Fork. huh? Red Fork. Mm -hmm. Red Fork. The first wells drilled there by, uh, uh, same company that had drilled the well up there by Bartlesville and discovered oil in Oklahoma. That connection between economics, Columbus Day, uh, remember he's looking for spice, a spice route, a spice trade route. That's why he's looking for uh, India in the first place. And then, uh, then they start, and then uh, immediately they start enslaving people. And, you know, has anyone ever seen any of those documentaries on if they didn't fill this amount of, uh, gold into these little bells that they would be, have arms chopped off, have limbs chopped off, you know, children. And uh, you start dealing with that, and you're like, oh, sweet Lord. And, and it's, it's always economic. The invasion by DeSoto and then his rape of Creek women was basically because they were not providing uh, adequate amount of treasures, specifically uh, uh, slaves for carrying his stuff because he was looking for gold. And so Columbus Day, that connection between economics and celebrations, we, we're going to have to start dealing with that uh, next. Something, too, I wanted to just mention, something I was just thinking about, because you and I, like, I, we talk and we think about these things so often, right? Um, and I think maybe for a lot of people in this room, it seems like there's a good amount of like native people in here. So sometimes it seems a bit like we're preaching to the converted, right? Um, but in case for other people in their room that aren't quite as like hip to Christopher Columbus and the way he did treat native American people, um, it really is kind of like the equivalent of like you wanting um, Jewish people to celebrate uh, Adolf Hitler. Um, he would round up our people, like indigenous people, and he was particularly cruel to them to where he would, um, in addition to rounding up um, native indigenous girls that were 
uh, in his journals, um, 10 and 11 were the popular age so that his men could rape. Um, 100, he, 100 Castellanos is what he actually writes in his di diary. Yeah. He, they could be traded for 100 Castellanos. Yes. Um, he would burn us alive just for fun of it if we didn't get enough um, gold or the goods that he was looking for, he would cut hands off and tie those hands around the neck of the person they just got chopped off from and make him go run. And dogs would attack them. And he would attention, you know, uh, take little babies, infants away from their parents and intentionally have uh, dogs attack that baby in front of their parents as a form of subjugation and torture and mental warfare. People don't ever talk about that in the history books, that part of Christopher Columbus and how he was a psychopath and not trying to be like histrionic bombastic here, but that's the caliber of man that we're dealing with. And I don't, maybe we should tell that in the, <laughs> in the history lessons in elementary school. Why would we celebrate that and continue to celebrate that here in America? Why are there cities that still really want to hold on to celebrating a man that did that? Not to mention the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the goddess of America originally was not Uncle Sam, but it was Columbia. That was her name. You know, she's on top of the uh, Capitol building at uh, the Congre at, you know, Congress. There she is, Columbia. And any time you look at some of those earlier depictions inside of books, it's always Columbia before it was Uncle Sam. You know, so this, this connection between uh, uh, Columbus and, and uh, subjugation. I mean, uh, one of the things I love and I had, uh, I would show my students was that picture of uh, Columbus with his foot on the world and uh, a native woman nude below him, you know, kneeling like this. And it was in our state Congress. It was in the rotunda up until 1956. And it's finally removed and you know so uh, and so they still have um, DeSoto in the gallery I believe and he's on and he's on that one one bill and DeSoto was was particularly I mean he just was raping women right and left I mean that's what they did when they went through uh, the pillaging and it was just destructive uh, of course he met uh, the great Choctaw warrior Tuscaloosa 2,000 Choctaws died in a day trying to stop him, uh, just had to throw that out there. So that was my male part of that uh, story. But when we're talking about Columbus and that, that whole period, again, it's, it, it gets back to, um, it seems like it's, it's been one version of, of economic motivation that's leading to these problems. It's, it, it's, it may be the central problem of our, of, of, our culture in, in the first place is these economic issues that, that, that drive uh, our inhumanity. So correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if I remember correctly, Columbus Day didn't occur until uh, the Italian Americans who found themselves in New York and along the East Coast were sort of trying to separate themselves from like the dirty Europeans and align themselves with the, the more Western, like English, German Europeans. And they found this guy Columbus and they were like, hey, He's Italian, like, let's celebrate, look, look how great we are. Don't, don't dislike us as much as you dislike African Americans and Irish people, like, we're, we're better than that. And they started championing Columbus's cause. And that is, as a, as a direct result of that championing, it, it made its way to DC and sort of became passed as a national holiday. World War I, World War II, does that ring true? Yeah, it does. I'm yeah, there we go. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not Italian-American, so I can't speak to that. I don't know quite the origins of Columbus Day, just that it's been here, you know, ever since I've been around. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of great things about uh, Italian-American culture. So they, they totally have a whole gamut of people they can pick from. Yeah, right. That's, that's I'm still trying to tie my head around wine and sofki. How do you... <laughs> they just says they had wine at these, at these things on celebration of Thanksgiving. I'm like, so that and sofki. It's going to be quite a, quite a combo. That's quite a combo. You haven't been to one of my Thanksgivings, have you? Because we totally have that combo. Oh, do you? <laughs> well, my goodness. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. So 
thought I would ask that. Yeah. So with that brief overview of sort of history of uh, Native Americans and co contact with Europeans, uh, let's move to more current issues. Um, so I think the one of the pink elephants in the room is sports mascots. Um, that and like we've got a we've got a school district with a sports mascot named after a, a pretty a pretty offensive like thing that I'm not going to point occurrence and <laughs> occurrence in uh, American history. Um, would you speak to the sports mascot? I I don't want to call it. Uh, like a hot topic because I think it's pretty obvious that it's in 1990 been polite. Yeah, 1991, <laughs> I was uh, on the student senate at Northeastern, and I tried to introduce uh, uh, legislation. I was trying to try to get the mascot, not the name Redmond, but the actual image changed to uh, a light horseman. And the reason I was trying to get it changed to a light horseman was because I felt that was contextually more accurate uh, dealing with the Cherokee Nation, dealing with law enforcement. Uh, uh, specifically among the Creeks, uh, they call him Istiwanaya, you know, ties men up. The light horsemen were prominent among the Choctaw. Uh, the Cherokees had several versions of it, and one of the versions that I liked was uh, they, at one point they called their uh, light horsemen regulators, and so I was like Redmond regulators. I was trying to get them to, to adopt an image of a light horseman, which was ultimately what I was wanting was uh, a, a, at least a mascot that was going to be riding a horse carrying a, carrying a uh, rifle with a badge on, riding on during, you know, riding onto the, onto the football field. Uh, I felt that that would have been more reflective and more accurate as an image, and then also it, it, it would tie to the, his, the historical fact that our people have always been law-abiding. I mean, you know, my goodness. Uh, Choctaws, I, I, I love going to the Creek Museum there, their, their council house, uh, you know, Choctaws and Creeks, we still did things the ancient way, and that is a guy, if a guy raped a woman, he got his hands tied, thrown over a tree, he was hound up, and then he received 100 lashes with, wow. with, with a stick, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, it was painful. Yes, it's cruel and unusual, but it was also very effective. And, you know, since we're a matrilineal society, it makes sense. You violate a woman, you're going to pay that. And so the second time they do it, they obviously lost, they, they forfeited their life. Now, the reason that I, I'm focusing on that is because there's this picture of, of the savages lawless and that were, tribes were anything but that. I mean, uh, when I talk about the clan law, number one, clans can't marry each other. So we didn't have this European, this whole European, uh, uh, we are chosen by God leadership idea where they can have incest, uh, serial incest. <laughs> among the leadership. I mean, seriously, these oh, yeah, kings were yeah. all akin to each other. Uh, you know, they're creating situations like the Hasburg jaw, porphyria, you name it. There's all these things that, uh, that, the, that the elite in Europe were creating because they're intermarriage. And our tribes, for some reason, who are treated as, as uh, primitive, had figured out clans don't marry the same clan. Raccoons don't marry raccoons. Wolves don't marry wolves. You know, and we somehow figured out that you've, your, your, your tree's got a branch, <laughs> okay? So when, when I'm dealing with, when you deal with a light horseman, you're dealing with an image of Indians as lawful, as having very sophisticated methods of controlling uh, how we interacted with each other. And so that's the image I was wanting on that mascot. I was wanting, I was wanting a lawman, an Indian lawman, just to just change the, change the flavor of mascots. Uh, because uh, regardless of what you do, you know, some of, the, some of my biggest detractors when I introduced that were my own people yeah. who were very supportive of the mascots. Oh, I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's like I have friends now that, cousins that, that love the Redskins. I'm, o I'm okay with it. I'm a Steelers fan, so I'm really okay with it. <laughs> They're not doing so great right now. But, but my point being is that uh, uh, I think, you know, perhaps union schools, if they're going to address that, you know, perhaps they need to look at something like a regulator, something that ties into the creeks, which like light horsemen, something that would, you know, just change the flavor of the mascot. And, you know, of course... Then again, uh, 
you know, 60% of all foods come from Native Americans. What are we, 5% of this world? And yet we provided 500 varieties of corn, 1,400 varieties of, of potatoes. Maybe we should be honored as the greatest agriculturalists on the planet. And we're somehow, since 60% of all foods come from Native American sources, why, why is that not part of the, the conversation? That we're the greatest agriculturalists probably ever. I mean, look at us. We're not as large as the, the Chinese. We're not as large as the Europeans. But we came up with the diversity, the biodiversity that feeds the world now. You know, not to mention I like popcorn. <laughs> so, anyway. I, don't, I don't think I can add anything else to the mascot, what you just said. Yeah. I will say, though, that, well, I guess I can add this. Um, why do I always talk about OU? So much stuff happened at OU, Matt, you know? Right I know. There's so much. Um, is that uh, there were two shirts that I used to have that I would wear around, and one of them showed, it was like in the likeness of like the Redskins logo, where it usually would have the hat, right? except it was made by Ryan Redcorn, and it said foreskins, and it just showed a flaccid penis. <laughs> and... <laughs> and that was always really fun to wear around, right? Um, because Oklahoma, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so it... it I feel like you have like the really good like academic. And I got like the jokes and stories no, over I'm here. Like, all right, um, like, all right. And so I remember being like in a grocery yep. store, and uh, this very polite kid, white kid, um, was he just briefly looked at my shirt and then saw like I had some beaded earrings on, as Native women do, and uh, he's like, you know, that's so cool, you got that shirt on. I I don't understand why people get so upset about the Redskins, and I was like. Did you look at the shirt more? And then he looked, and he's like, oh, and he's just very confused. And I'm like, I'm actually not for the Redskins, and detailed him why. Um, and then, yeah. And then there was another one I had where it just showed, like, a very generic, kind of like a baseball tee, right? And it just showed uh, a profile of a white man, blonde-haired, uh, and it just said Caucasians and man. There's a few times I thought I was going to get punched in the face for wearing that one. But then when you talk about, you know, try to have some sort of intellectual dialogue about um, mascots and Tontoism and why we're still seen as caricatures, uh, very cartoonish, you know, like just think of how we're portrayed with these huge noses in the uh, classic Disney movie, Peter Pan. Um, you know, um, people seem to not make those connections. And so I've noticed particularly with uh, the, it was always like white men that had such a visceral reaction to me wearing a shirt that just said straight up Caucasians, uh, didn't even say honkies. Um, and it's like, well, let, let's try to unpack this. Like, why do you think you're, I'm really interested in why are you having this emotional reaction right now? And why do you think I would not have that same reaction whenever I see um, the chief Wahoo, you know, that's made to just look like this, like probably pigeon speaking, stupid Indian, which uh, for all the Indians I know are very articulate. Um, and uh, maybe it wasn't the best conversational piece, um, but it was definitely like me putting on my like native anthropology hat going into white America, Midwest America, and just like seeing that the cognitive dissonance is strong here, very strong. So I worked in a, an office once where the, the guy had a poster up and it had the Washington Redskins and it had the New York Jews and the like, Pennsylvania Krauts and all these different like teams with these you know sort of slurish mm -hmm. things but none of them said like you know crack or anything like that yeah. which I think we're getting closer to that level of slur when we're talking about some of the mascot names or some of the team names and some of the depictions and of the mascots uh, so that was like as a, as a young person when I when I saw that that sort of like woke me up to the idea that like oh my yeah I've never thought about the portrayal of people 
any people in a, in a way. And I was like, these mascots are, so that sort of, a, that I, I, liked the, I liked that pairing together of the things. And I like your t-shirt, that, that brought that back to my mind too. Yeah, I lost that Foreskins t-shirt during a move. I wish I still had it. Right, I'd, yeah. I'd give you a dollar for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but. And so, and so, yeah, oh yeah. And so with that, you know, oh, I think we would be quite appalled if we saw um, a sports team that had a caricature of uh, an African-American person, right? That, that would be like readily shocking. But the other thing you gotta remember with us native people is how we're not seen necessarily as all the way as humans still. How even in the uh, Declaration of Independence, we're still referred to as by our founding fathers as merciless Indian savages is right there. Like, I like fireworks, they're cool, but I really could give a shit about 4th of July. Um, for that reason. Um, and then in addition to that, of us seeing as maybe like less than human, we're the only ethnicity race where we have to uh, mathematically quantify our Indianness. Who else has to do that? It's also uh, dogs and horses where you gotta prove your pedigree. That's a good point. Well, the mascot issue, 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 as you were talking about that, one of the things I thought about was, uh, you know, the Vikings. Uh, that, uh, that if, if, if that part of the United States, which is, tends to be more Scandinavian, are okay with the Viking image, uh, that it just seems like, well, then they're able to, ca they're able to categorize uh, their ancestors into a historical reality. Uh, the problem with the Indian mascot issue is that uh, it's always historically inaccurate. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, and so that's, it, it's, it, this whole issue of, uh, uh, of why I said the light horseman is because, you know, it's just a different image of an Indian with a badge. And it's not something you associate with Indians unless you're from our communities. Uh, and, and now that uh, I found out, so my, Great grandfather Ben Carterby was one of the Choctaw co talkers. And when I found his thing on Fold Three that he was an Indian policeman before that, uh, I was like, oh, cool. You know, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was light horse uh, before he was, uh, before he'd served in, in World War I. Why can't we grab a hold of those images within that? If, if we're going to be forced with mascots, why, were, why are those not the central images? And it's, it's because of, uh, you know, the need for tantalism, the need for a barbarian, you know, and so uh, unfortunately it's going to, it will continue to be perpetuated because of that. I think that leads into sort of the appropriation issue that comes up in Halloween, like having mascots that are Native Americans allows people to dress up as the mascot, which is problematic if you're, you're putting on red face, right? Uh, I think that is experienced in the African-American world in live music shows when young white kids are singing along to the music and just belting out the N-word at the shows, right? So by the mascots taking, looking like Indian caricatures, and I think that's sort of a, a, sort of a segue into the discussion of just appropriation in general, like if, whether it's Halloween or like music festival season, you're gonna see somebody in like a headdress or feathers or appropriating some sort of part of uh, the United States and mass conception of Indian culture, which is largely monocultural in the United States's, United States's conception of it. Uh, would you speak to um, cultural appropriation and festival season and Halloween and the non-monolithic, the non-universal Native American culture? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I should start by saying, you know, for me and how do I say your first name? Trey, Tig? Okay, Trey, I'm gonna make sure I get it right. I know you're Ch Choctaw. Yeah. Norwe the Norwegian comes in on my Inupiat side. My dad was, I'm a relocation kid. Mom met my dad in California. He was sent from Alaska. I was, okay, I was wondering, because I was looking at that, yeah, right, it was like, yeah. was that a Haskell baby or, no, you know? 
Relocation. You and, okay. That's like, how did that mix come together? Yeah. If you understand tribal geography, that's like really far away. That's yeah, far away. We um, both met in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, BIA. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, he and I, though, what I'm getting at, at least with the Choctaw and me being Muscogee, we're Southeast people. So our people um, generally, we were, we were farmers. <laughs> like, we were not really that nomadic. Uh, we had our Idalwas, our, our, our tribal towns, our villages, and they were either white towns or red towns. And I won't even get into the significance of that. Um, well, you should. Oh, I should? I think you should. Okay. Because people don't understand it. Unpack that for us. Huh? Unpack that for us. Oh, God. <laughs> so, uh, so, for instance, my um, original tribal town, my Idolwa is Taplaco, and we are a red town, which means that we are a war town. Um, and there are uh, white towns, too, and uh, Idolva's uh, villages, and those were considered to be the towns of peace. And so you need both, depending contextually, uh, for a situation, because you may need to go to a red town to have um, a game of stickball. You know, for our people, we would try to have a game of, before going to full out war and possibly killing each other, we tried to solve it through stickball. Uh, which means the little brother of war. And the way that stickball is played now is very different than the way we played it traditionally, where it's a social game now. But the way that it used to be played was very brutal. Um, uh, the only rule is that there are no rules, and sometimes people did die. But it was a matter of maybe just like a few people dying rather than um, hundreds of people dying. And those would be those disputes would be settled in the red towns. That's where I come from. Whereas mm -hmm. if somebody was seeking refuge um, and trying to escape possibly persecution, they would run away to a white town to where no matter what, even whatever that person did, they can't be touched while they're in that town. Now they, it, it, the matter would still get handled, but that person couldn't be killed while they were in a white town. It's sanctuary city. Yeah, sanctuary. And ICE would still find you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, what was this question again? Oh yeah, appropriation. And so, um, briefly, I was just talking about a little bit about like our Southeast culture and how what I was getting at is that we are not Plains tribes. There's like over 560 tribes here in America. And funny enough, just to kind of give you an idea of like how Native Americans are seen as just maybe like this one tribe, whenever I've traveled to Europe, um, I still get asked, you know, if, if I'm still living in teepees, um, if my family has a TV that we watch, and if we still hunt buffalo, and those were asked to me unironically, um, which I can't help but laugh at. And then it's never as sexy to say, nah, we farmed corn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that ruins the image for them. And so, with Halloween costumes, with some of these things that you see going on at uh, summer music festivals like Coachella, um, it's as if that's all that we are, these Plains tribes like Lakota. It would be a huge dishonor if either of us were to wear a headdress because there's a very strict protocol of who can and cannot. and. Um, things, milestones you had to have met in life to even have the um, recognition and honor to wear a headdress. So that would be, I don't know, whatever the sacred cows are to people, like a police officer uniform, a military uniform, um, a nun robe of me putting that on and getting drunk. Um, I didn't earned that right to wear those things. And so that's the same with like the headdresses and, and um, it just paints this caricature, caricature of us that's very inaccurate. And, you know, 
I, when I've tried to talk about this with people before, he's like, well, what's the problem if I dress up as a cowboy? There isn't anything with you dressing up as a cowboy because there's, that's, that's a profession. It's not an ethnicity. It's not a culture. That's the big difference when people try to be like, why this? Well, you can dress up as any profession as you want. Being an Indian is not a profession. It's our identity. I wouldn't, can't do that. Oh, your turn. My turn. Appropriation. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just go ahead and go there. Uh, it is called the Real Talk series. Yeah. Uh, my heroes, uh, one of my heroes is uh, in, in probably a lot of people, is definitely was um, uh, Angie DeBose heroes, Kate Bernard. And we're going to have, I, I've written a book on her. Uh, I'm still trying to get it published, but the reason I'm, I'm talking about her is because when you deal with appropriation, uh, she was, uh, my book focuses on one little girl that I, I was reading. I was doing research on the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Uh, Melissa remembers this when I was trying to, uh, I, was, I, was, I was working on the history of Paul Nebel's uh, exploration. I think it's, that was his name. No, it was, I can't, Oppler, Dr. Oppler, right? That had did the examination in the early 1900s on the travel towns of, the, of, the, uh, of long story short, in the testimony, I found the, the name of a girl. Her name was Yuli Eagle. She was, uh, I since have found out what her travel town was. I know it's 27177 was her allotment now in Creek County. Now, the reason that's important is because Yuli Eagle was uh, eight years old and uh, four months in March, she, did, she got her allotment, uh, was assigned to her. Four months later, she was found hanged. Now, Yuli Eagle is important because, guess what? She was worth $26 million at the time. This is in 1900, which is hundreds of millions today. And you start dealing with all the Creek kids that were killed, kidnapped, uh, which is detailed by Debo, but actu not actual names. Uh, appropriation seems to be the, the what Tulsa is built on. <laughs> okay, uh, when I when you see the the Cosden building downtown, all I can see is uh, you know you have that nice uh, Art Deco. We're in a Phillips building. Okay, so the intersection between oil and the appropriation of the funds that belong to all these Creek kids, whose allotments these were, uh, Ida, Ida Glenn's well, which is the Glen Pool. Uh, you start dealing with these kids that were murdered that Kate Bernard was wrestling with. Uh, and you realize that appropriation still goes on because no one says to that Cosden building, hey, that is the original, um, and that's the that's the original uh, Cushing oil field was her allotment. Okay, we don't we say it's the Cushing oil field. We don't say that that is Yuli Eagles, a Creek Girls oil field, where it started. Does that make sense? It's like it's disambiguated. Uh, we know that the famous Creek uh, Gilcrease was very was very affluent, uh, but he is an exception. There's there are there are Creek exceptions. Uh, where we need to focus on appropriation, I hope I didn't make you chabak. <laughs> uh, when, we, when we're dealing with appropriation of, of Tulsa, uh, it seems like there's, now that we're addressing the, 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 um, the, the Tulsa race massacre, okay? We're sti we still are, are not dealing with the fact that this town was built on oil that belonged to someone else. Mm -hmm. well, this, wait, I'd like to say we are working on that. But, okay, um, there we go. All right. But I have to keep my cards close to my chest oh, gotcha. right now. But yeah. come uh, turn of the year, there'll be more into that spoken of. Because, uh, and the reason I'm focused on Yuli is because uh, as I did research on her, uh, uh, the company came out of Holdenville. Right? That started. Um, uh, that started. Uh, that was trying to get a hold of her property, and that company uh, has some very powerful families who donated to the Tulsa University and to all these other institutions. Um, and um, long story short is that appropriation is still 
it's, we're still having a hard time divorcing ourselves from, from that. History. It speaks to your names of the current names of the colleges in Oklahoma as well. Like, why aren't they named Cherokee State University or whatever? Like, um, I think a more recent example is the Gathering Place yes. uh, that was built on an Osage tribal property. Is no. It? It's Lojaboga. Lojaboga. That was Creek. That was Creek. Creek? He was mm -hmm. Creek. Would, would you speak to that? Uh, I will talk about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was a Creek man, um, and that was his allotment. He had, it was approximately on the corner of uh, where his cabin was. So I just want you to think back like 100 years of what Tulsa, and if you didn't know, did you all, I know some of you know this, but uh, Tulsa, its origin set etymology is a Muskogee word. It's a Creek word. It comes from our word Idolva, which means town or village, and then just kind of turned Creeklish. Idolva turned into Tulsa. So think uh, of what this place looked like 100 years ago, or even further back, more than 100 years ago. Think about Riverside Drive. Think about the Arkansas River. That was all not developed. It was very beautiful. And um, there was the water source, there was the Arkansas, um, the deer were plentiful, and uh, there was a Creek Indian that lived there, and he had 160 acres. That was his allotment land. And he had a cabin, and it was approximately on the corner of Cincinnati and Hazel. And there's, you can still actually visit that corner. Uh, it's in the Maple Ridge neighbor, neighborhood currently. Um, but whenever he um, was on his deathbed, there I can't remember the names of the white men that were coming, but they were Tulsa City developers. And somehow in the span of one week as he's on his deathbed, their names ended up on his will. And they were able to get some of that land. And so whenever the gathering place was being developed, there was a group of us local native people that were asked to um, be a part of it and be part of this discussion. And this is kind of my problem with like philanthrocapitalism, um, well-meaning middle-class white liberals. I mean, I'm friends with them, okay? They're some good <laughs> people, okay? Um, but some are a little tone deaf. Um, God bless them. Uh, where we were called in, and I feel like some of the, and this was towards the end, this was like a few months before the gathering place was supposed to open, um, where they had to like, talked to all the different like brown people of Tulsa. So they talked to like the Muslim community, I think, the Latino community, uh, African-American, Native American community. And so I was part of like the Native American community, right? And so they wanted us to talk about that land. And so me being a Muscogee person, I talked about how that was originally uh, belonged to a Creek man and how he got swindled out of that. And it would be really great if we had had input into the gathering place, not three months before it was opening, but maybe towards the beginning of the project, if there had, could have been some sort of collaboration between the Kaiser Family um, Foundation and Creek Nation even, of how we could have some of our culture incorporated into the gathering place, honoring that land in some capacity. Um, at least in Arbor, at yeah. least Arbors. Yeah. yeah, Arbors would be great. Um, and what it quickly came to is like, you know, trying to talk about this and uh, it's like maybe like some sort of commemorative plaque, something, um, it just kept turning into, oh, well, it's already, the landscape architect, it's already done. We can't plant any like traditional grasses, or seeds, or plants or anything like that. Landscape architecture's done. Uh, all the art is already done. There's no room for a plaque. Um, and then uh, they asked, well, what we kind of were wondering is if uh, we could have a Native American day and you guys could come out and, uh, and uh, do something and help us plan this Native American day. 
at uh, the gathering place. And I'm friends with some people that have done that, but I'm Godspeed to them. But it just seemed a bit disingenuous where I thought we were trying to have a candid conversation between Native people and the people um, developing the gathering place, uh, trying to recognize that that's Native land that they're on. But really, they just wanted us to come put on our Indian clothing and do like a dance. Indian, <laughs> The Indian coming out of the cupboard. Um, and putting on our regalia, and uh, I'm not really, that's not really my scene. So, um, you know, we heard from the gathering place people, this is really good, I like this dialogue, where it's going, let's keep this conversation going, we're gonna have another meeting, uh, which never materialized, shocker. So, yeah, that's kind of my, I feel conflicted, I think it's, gathering place is fun. I take my son there. I've hung out there a few times. But whenever I go, I always feel super conflicted as a Muscogee female being there and still recognizing that, yeah, this is a great thing. It's very unique, what we have. Um, but it's just a continuation of just not honoring Oklahoma history and legacy and how Tulsa is a town was developed to begin with and continues to be developed. You're up. Okay. Uh, when I was uh, when I was thinking about it, when I told them I was going to wear my ribbon shirt, the, re the real reason I wear it is because uh, the Choctaw ribbon shirt is is rattlesnake. Uh, so. I don't mind saying it. Secretly, I, in the back of my head, I'm always thinking about the snake movement, Chitto Harjo, and you know, uh, this, uh, the resistance that's been going on since before anyone was here. Uh, the issues of, uh, and this collision between economics, uh, the state, and ourselves is, I think it's going to, it's going to persist mainly because ultimately uh, we're running in, we're, we're gonna run into issues of, uh, of religion, and I'm, I'm just gonna go there. Uh, it's always been fascinating to me, uh, being raised in an Indian Methodist church, uh, which means, by the way, we had camp houses that looked very much like a ceremonial ground. Uh, growing up in, in that, I did, you, when you're growing up in it as a kid, you don't realize all of the patterns. You don't recognize the deacons. You don't recognize any of that stuff, uh, the ancient symbology that's there, uh, how it was indigenized, so to speak. Uh, long story short, uh, when, you're, when you deal with religion, one of the arguments that I've always had was, so... Uh, uh, Having come from a family of preachers, I'm just qualifying it. I'm, I have to excuse me. But uh, if God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then when does the when does jubilee occur? And that's when every 50 years the land returns to those that originally owned the land. I mean, that, if that was God's law in the Old Testament, and we all like taught, and everyone in this state, especially uh, in their fundamentalism, likes talking about Old Testament laws then, you know, when are they going to talk about Jubilee laws? Every 49 years, the 50th year is a year of Jubilee, the land returns. Because we're almost three Jubilees past the land being returned to my people. Okay? And so you start dealing with these intricacies. If God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then why is this not a principle that's taught within our churches? And so if the tribes start teaching this inside our churches, are we, are we going to be, you know, is that going to become a, a place of contention? Another issue is uh, uh, when you start dealing with the, the Jubilee Law and uh, some of those other laws is uh, the, the Constitution directly says treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. I didn't write the Constitution, but that's what it says. Treaties written shall be the supreme law of the land, which means that those treaties that our people have are sacred. They're, they are covenants. So... When does the scripture get applied, what is bound on earth is bound in heaven, right? Whatever you bind on, on earth shall be bound in heaven. In other words, if the covenants are here on earth between us and are sacred, and if they're done anno domini, in the name of, the, in the year of the Lord, 
then when, when does that, when does Christianity start re realizing that, uh, that they have an obligation toward, towards honoring those treaties? And so the reason that becomes important is because the Creeks, Choctaws, and the Jalagi, I know have land patents. I know the Creeks have a land patent given to them for this specific acreage that we're on now. It is a patent. It's not, we're beyond feudalism now. It's not just title. It's not just land title. It's an actual political jurisdiction. And so now we're going to start arguing with the governor again over compacts. Okay? Something that was already agreed to, and now he wants to renegotiate. It's, it's like every generation. It's a, it's a renegotiation of those old treaties again. And I don't think tribes are, should back down from it. Uh, I, don't, I think we should say, well, we got a land patent. Uh, and if you believe the Constitution, the treaty should be the supreme law of the land, then we're going to execute our, our sovereignty. And our, we're going to continue to insist on it. doesn't mean it's going to change, okay? But I, I, tend, to, I, I tend to be uh, uh, long-viewed the seventh generation issue, and that is I'm hoping someday my great-great-grandkids will see, will see something like what happened in Scotland. I'm hoping there will be a vote someday for the state of Sequoia, I'm, I'm just being honest, okay? And that uh, at least there will be shared political control of this, of this area of the state. Should you explain to people what the state of Sequoia is? For oh, those so, that may not know. Okay. Indian Territory, uh, as she and I were talking, I was always impressed with the Okmulgee Constitution. And I think the reason that uh, the other tribes, the other five tribes chose the, the Creeks as uh, to write the Constitution was because the Creeks had already adapted uh, a confederacy. They had brought in other groups that were not part of their tribal towns. One of the most significant was the Yuchi, who don't even speak Muscogean. They incorporated them in, uh, as well as the Nachi, and the Nachi were uh, incorporated in among the, among the Cherokee. So the five tribes attempt to create their own state, which was, by the way, passed, I mean, it passed overwhelmingly for the state of Sequoia. Uh, but because, uh, you know, I believe is because Standard Oil was wanting a hold of Creek Oil, there was no way that Oklahoma was going to become, a, would, they were going to allow an Indian state. And so as a result, they forced uh, the two territories together. And that's why I started, when I was talking about hegemony, that picture of the cowboy marrying the Indian female is, goes straight back to Pocahontasism, Right? you have the cowboy all of a sudden gets the property of the Indian woman. Except, except, as I speak to this podcast and to my great-great-grandkids, remember, women own the property, so you can get it back and ask for a divorce. Okay? It's time for the Indian female, the Indian territory, the woman, the Cherokee woman that was forced into the marriage, the shotgun wedding with the state of Oklahoma, to say, we want half. We want a divorce. You've been an abusive husband, okay? You keep, you keep beating us, you keep subjugating us, and now you want us to negotiate on gaming compacts, you know? And so, and then you, we know that you're, you're politically always going to, it's always going to end up in the courts. The courts always change back and forth. Ultimately, I'm hoping that my great-great-grandkids someday uh, that will end up where Scotland ended up, where we can vote as to whether or not we're going to stay in the union. Whether or not we're going to stay as part of Oklahoma is what I'm getting at. Does that make sense? And it's not to it's not it's not about uh, domination. It's just about acknowledgement that there's people that have been uh, sovereign here for ten thousand years, and this state is what what was the state hundred something years old, mm -hmm. and there's just an expectation. I had a very good person ask me, when are you guys going to become American? We've been American forever. Welcome to our country. And so ultimately, I think Indians should never give up that hope, the hope of Sequoia. Uh, because it was, it, was the, it, was, it was not the final dream. It was an expectation that we would continue politically well, well into, you know, for hopefully for the next 300 years. Uh, I've always been impressed with the Scottish vote as to whether or not they're going to remain within the United Kingdom. I just wish that uh, someday that we, we arrive at a political sophistication inside this state that they can at least ask us, 
do you tribes still want to remain part of Oklahoma? And I'm, I'm, I'm suspecting that two thirds of my grandkids will say, yeah, we want to stay in Oklahoma, you know. But I'm hoping that there's at least one or two of them that, you know, look at their, look back on this podcast maybe and say, yeah, Mark was right. We still stand for the state of Sequoia. I think that, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I meant to say this earlier when I was talking about the gathering place, but that Creek Indian man, his name was uh, Tokobachi. Um, I should definitely state his name out loud. Tokobachi's land should be recognized. It's where the um, gathering place is now. He totally got stolen out of his land. Kaiser family doesn't want to acknowledge that. Um, and with that, kind of speaking to what you were saying a little bit, um, I do see tribes slowly, slowly um, kind of flexing sovereignty in different ways. Something that uh, is current, um, too, is uh, the new chief of uh, Cherokee Nation, Chief H Hoskins, where I think this is a total baller move on his end, where uh, Cherokee Nation gives millions of dollars to school districts, right? They don't have to do that. That typically comes from taxpayer money and really should be coming in a unique place like this, Oklahoma. I feel like that should also be coming from a lot of the oil companies and the gas industry, but they don't. Why is that? Um, but leave it to Indian people. We always think about those in our community, whether they're native or not, how can we help out? And so Cherokee Nation, for uh, certain school districts where there's a high population of um, their tribal people, they give millions of dollars. And Chief Hoskins has done a move recently where if those certain schools in those districts don't start allowing native students to dress in their traditional regalia and uh, graduation wearing the feathers, that money is stopping. And that would, I imagine, especially for the more rural school districts, really hurt them. And I think it's moves like that where people here in Oklahoma that are not native need to start taking us seriously and what we do contribute to the economy of this state. I would say that moves us nicely into, uh, after this heavy in parts but informative conversation, something brighter. What does a successful, what, is a, what does success in the future look like? What does a, a, a vibrant, thriving native community look like in the future? And how do allies help without being the great white savior? Like, how does one avoid that? She, she told me, when she just said that name, uh, so it didn't resonate. I know it resonated with uh, Melissa. Uh, if his name was Tagabachi, that's one of the mother towns of the Creeks. Uh, so his name, he was named for one of the uh, most important tribal towns, not to mention. Uh, the other one was Kuita, another mother town. Uh, things that ancient places that people don't recognize and so I I think that one of the things I would like to see you know you're talking about hope I think I think there should be a movement to rename Northeastern State Cherokee State University to rename Southeastern State Choctaw State University and that's not to diminish the state but that's just to at least give acknowledgement that I mean my goodness Northeastern State was built in 1846 it's the oldest female seminary west of the Mississippi. And uh, it's just, um, I mean, Kendall College was founded because the Creeks, Choctaws, and, and Cherokees recognized one thing, and that was we had to train more of our females, because we're matrilineal, to become teachers, school teachers. So those teacher colleges, education has its roots in the tribes. And I think that acknowledgement is, is going, it needs to happen soon. Uh, that education did not start with Tulsa Public Schools. I tell you one of the things that I get, uh, um, I get really annoyed about, and uh, Vicki listens to me incessantly about this, and I apologize for that. When I drive into Oatmulgee and I see it founded 1811 or 1911, whatever, on the signs, Oatmulgee founded, I'm like, that is just, it's just so insulting that, 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 the, that the Chamber of Commerce of Oatmulgee City Still cannot put on there, you know, found it, found it after the removal. And, you know, uh, it, let me, uh, that's one of those things in the textbooks that I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on. I'm, I have to quote it real quick. 
because uh, I did the estimation on the removal. And if you look at, so 2,000 Seminole died on the Trail of Tears. Over 3,500 Creeks died on the Trail of Tears. Over 4,000 Cherokee died. Over 2,000 Choctaw died. And if, so if you do the percentages, the highest percentage is right at 40%, which was the Seminole loss. If you attribute that to all the other tribes, the Delawares, the Shawnees, the Kickapoos, Ottawas, Peorias, Potawatomis, Senecas, that means anywhere between 20,000 to 30,000 Indians died for Indian territory. And so just acknowledging, you know, the textbooks, one of the things that I've, I've been fighting on the textbooks is they like to say percentages. They like to say, you know, 25% died or 20% died. I think that one of the things that, that will make this place more, more hopeful is like acknowledging the massacre, the race massacre, is that if the state would at least start acknowledging that the tribes paid for this land with our blood, literally. Does that make sense? 30,000 lives were exchanged for, the, for, the, for, this, for this treaty right to this property. And so when we, when we, when we start discussing uh, the hope of the future, I'm just hoping that uh, uh, the rest of Oklahoma will at least come around to saying, well, you know, the, 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 the Indian people paid a significant price to be here, to be right here. And uh, uh, that's, that's my hope, you know, that that would be, that there's, you know, because we, we talk about the, uh, we, and so then they'll, they'll say, well, but uh, service in the military. Well, then, then you go back to the highest service uh, for the Indian Home Guard was Creeks. 3,500 Creeks joined the Union Army. 1,000 something joined the Confederacy. It's that distortion that happens inside our history books. And so my hope is, is that we can get past those distortions and start dealing with uh, that the Creeks, Creeks paid, a, paid the last full measure of devotion for this property. And, you know, and uh, regardless if Kevin Stitt is from here or not, uh, he, 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 he cannot just come and demand uh, funds from the Creeks. I'm sorry. I, was, uh, I thought I was going to let you get more radical. That was, that was on no. point. Okay. <laughs> so, Apollonia, it's 3.30. Uh, I do want to leave some time for questions and answers, but I do want to hear what, to you, a successful future looks like and how, pe how allies can help without being, you know, big-headed and savior about it. Right. Um, so I think you were speaking more macro, and I'm going to speak a bit micro, um, particularly because I am a Muskogee Hoke team. And again, I try to be an optimist here. I do see this slowly happening to where I would really like it if particularly Native men um, started recognizing and honoring, you know, especially for ones that t tend to go on about how, you know, traditional they are. They're like super woke Indian activist guys, but then they don't treat native women correctly and they don't honor our matrilineage and sometimes our matriarchal structure systems and our voices. Um, if they were very traditional and so woke traditional, then they should also honor that part and not just cherry pick the parts that they would like to recognize and honor. I see more Native men coming around to that um, and recognizing um, how they could get better, how they could be better, how they can hold other Native men accountable as well. And I do see more and more in communities, Native women being more outspoken, having a stronger voice and decision making rather than just allowing the men to make the decisions. Um, so those are just kind of some ways that I see. Um, other ways I would like to see is if certain um, city, Tulsa city developers would start being more intentional and not just lip service to recognizing the process in which Tulsa was acquired from Creek people, particularly with the gathering place. That would be real fun, wouldn't it? All right, then, with that, uh, are there any questions? Yes, yeah. please, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is in regards to the uh, I, 
I should state this, and I feel like I could probably speak for both of us. We're just two random Indians up here. Like, we can't speak for every single Native person, more than 560 tribal nations. Um, I, you know, there's some Native people that I know that are really anti-Thanksgiving, particularly if they come from the tribes that were directly affected by it out east. Um, and they will not honor it. They will not recognize it. Um, they do a day of mourning. Uh, that's not quite the stance that I take on it. It's one of my favorite holidays, but I've made it into my own thing with my friends. And so uh, I think for a non-native person, a way of maybe them recognizing it is perhaps having some difficult conversations with your family about the true origins of Thanksgiving and why that is. And, you know, seeing if there's locally any like native gatherings going on and festivities, because sometimes there are, and maybe trying to see it from a different perspective and going to one of those functions rather than Macy's Day Parade. I, I don't even think it should necessarily be renamed because I really love the idea of what Thanksgiving is, uh, really genuinely. It's not about some football game. It's about genuinely being thankful for what you have, even if, even if it's not much, even if it's just being in a place where you're gathered with your favorite people and eating food and that's what you have and you're not hungry and just being, giving thanks. It's very... Um, it's a very indigenous way of thinking about things, uh, not being materialistic. It's very anti-capitalist, anti-America, American. Um, and so trying to think of it in those capacities, which I think is sometimes difficult, and I don't, <laughs> please don't take it away, I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very Indian, time to eat. <laughs> yeah, humbox. Uh, you know, so. That's what we do, as you know. So when we celebrate, we eat. So I don't. I I think that uh, uh, I think that it's it's it's. I like the holiday as she states. I just I wish that uh, as I mentioned the history textbooks. I wish I wish we could get around to when you think about the Earth people, the Potato Clans among the Creeks, Cherokees, um, Choctaws had a had a potato. It's 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 about Earth. And it's about celebrating the bounty that uh, Mother Earth gives us. And so I, I see a connection between it and, and the, the tribal populations, not to mention the fact that the Creeks, you know, their, their uh, new year starts in July, you know. And so uh, it's, it's fitting within you know, the life structure, you know, before you go into the winter months. I don't have anything significant. I was just going to say ditto, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Thought I better say Why? something. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, education uh, goes back to the education uh, center again. One of the things I realized in uh, uh, with the especially be, the creeks being so progressive, and it's probably because of the, especially because of the strength of the matrilineal system, 
because uh, you're dealing with education and ultimately is intimate with, 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 uh, with the mothers. Okay? I mean, that's where it origi originates. Uh, tribal identity is always going to be based on how strong your mother is in her tribal identity. And so uh, my mother was very strong in it. Uh, when she was talking about men respecting women, uh, I was feeling punished, which is what my mom would do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here we go. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but so recognizing, uh, recognizing that kids are who their moms are ultimately it probably plays more into the identity issue than anything. And uh, most, most tribes are matrilineal. And most tribes trace their clans through the mother. Uh, I don't know any that try trace through the father. I'm trying to. I've been, I've been looking. I haven't seen, found one yet. Uh, you know the uh, uh, when they passed that law back in the 1980s that was recognizing the Iroquois' contribution to the Constitution. One of the things that was really cool about that is the fact that uh, it was the elder women that were the Supreme Court for removing of, of, of men. I think that uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that what I'm saying is, is that's available for people to teach. And so teaching kids that, yeah, it was the old, it was the old female clan mothers that determined if this chief stayed chief or not. If he, if he earned the right to re remain a leader, uh, which meant that there was a, there was a, there was a balance there. It's, and so on identity issues, kids may not even know that. I mean, because a lot of, a lot of culture is just really unspoken. And so until you get to my age and you look back, you're like, oh, that's why my grandma was running my life. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> well, I'm going to just pause. This is not, even though it's going to sound like it, this is not me calling you out. Uh, and plus, you get a, you. Get, oh, okay. Plus, you're like Danae, so you get a pass. Um, so. Uh, just a quick comment, because he said five civilized, so I tried oh, to just say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I just always say five tribes, because uh, when you think about like when we get called the five civilized tribes, what does that imply? And then what is the inverse? Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. 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 I know, I know. Yeah, you get a pass, you can from here. Um, so, God, I can't even remember what you were necessarily asking, so I really just went about by. Tying, she's talking about tying policy to the funds, like the Cherokees, what they're doing with, Hosk with Hoskins. Yeah, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I can't really speak to policy because my background is so much in just like uh, math and science. So I don't know too much about policy in that realm. I'm in a deficit there. The, uh, I, one of the things... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. They do.
That's correct. Yes. Uh, the, yes. I agree. I don't know what to say on this. It, I don't know of any of those. It's, 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 it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the issue of the mascot issue that when we were talking about that. There's such a diversity of view within our people that I actually appreciate the diversity of the view. And so some, some people would say, yes, we should, we should hold uh, school districts accountable for that kind of, for, for like Hoskins is attempting to do. Uh, I think it should go further, but I, I'm, I'm also, uh, I'm, I also realize that I don't speak uh, for, for all Choctaw. I don't even speak for my own clan probably. Uh, uh, I think I think they I think enough of my family would say yeah we like that but uh, uh, some of them are more accommodationist because of their nature they're nicer people than I am <laughs> uh, uh, when I think about money and policy I I, I think that there should be um, I, I don't think we're doing enough I love the fact that they're doing that United We Thrive what a United We Are, whatever that program is, the tribes are doing together since Stitt's going after the funds. Okay, uh, I, I actually like that. I like the Chickasaws, you know, their, their commercials. And the reason I do, they don't always, they're informative. And I was like, you know, I, I want to argue with them because as Chata, they're, they're our sister tribe. Chikasha, Chata, we, we split a long time ago. I don't even know how long ago, uh, but the but the fact is is that uh, I, when I think of the the Creek Confederacy, they fought against each other so much because each tribal town is so diverse, so unique, uh, and I think that uh, we need to welcome the diversity of opinion uh, on on policy as well because uh, I I I tend to be a, a I just want to I want I have my expectations of what I want to be taught. Does that make sense? I hate it that I'm in this state and there's not a standard uh, Indian Indian history textbook yet. Yeah. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. There's not a, we don't even have a, this is, this state is founded on Indian education, as I stated, and we still do not have a standard Indian history textbook. Well, I mean, it's, it's, and it's like, uh, see, I mean, uh, even for Latin American studies, uh, uh, you know, the Aztec didn't call themselves Aztec, they call themselves Mexica, you know, and so most kids don't even realize that their, that entire country is named for a tribe, you know, it's, it's, it's like uh, the Jalagi, the Cherokee had a, had a village that was called Tanasi, that's where Tennessee comes from, you know, and all these, all these states are named from Native people. I mean, you look at these sources it's like Tulsa, Tulsi Town, you know. And she mentioned the guy's name was uh, Tagabachi, and it's just uh, it. It just seems like our we are incrementally moving. Uh, I don't think at a speed that I like. No. You know. Did you have a question?
Yeah, uh, to kind of answer your question, to my knowledge, and I don't know everything, um, it's generally I just see native people doing the native work. It would be really awesome if there's like a lot of the different minorities of Tulsa working collabor collaboratively together. Um, it seems like a little difficult to pull off. Um, and I don't know necessarily what those collaborations would be, but it means a system of supporting each other. Um, maybe you can speak more to that about, I. And then to answer your question, like uh, I think you said like some schools with like the Seminole name or something? Project? Project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Apache Manor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't even, yeah, I haven't heard anything uh, about people wanting to change those names. I think they're focusing on like the bigger ones that have more visibility, like the union red skins mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah you know uh tams bixby who was in charge of the dawes law i mean i, I just love history because uh you start dealing with uh, uh the railroads uh, there's a great book by h craig minor called uh, the uh, corporation and the indian okay when you start talking about appropriations i i think it, it, it's it just seems like if we, it's like when I was talking earlier about the, the oil issues in Tulsa, you start, you start addressing that and you're just like, I, I don't know if the foundations would be supportive of that real history. Does that make sense? Because it, Cosden, by the way, Cosden Oil Company, uh, he's the one that bought out a lot of the Cushing oil field. Cosden eventually uh, became Sun Oil, which is our refinery here. So when I talk about that little girl's allotment being the, the focus of, uh, of uh, the Cushing oil field uh, and the relationship between that and Tulsa, uh, I've often wondered if, if, um, if, those, if, those, if it would become apolitical, you know, just to start asserting. So I, I, I tend to, you're right though, tribes should, should start using their funds and leveraging it but I don't know how, I don't know how to do it without being apolitic. Does that make sense? They're not ready because if we started having those conversations, it would be a conversation of whose land we're actually on and uh, what should we, what city people should be doing to possibly acknowledge that it was stolen from us and maybe some Indian people, I know of a few, I'm one of them, would like to have some of it back. They're not even ready to have that conversation. And I mean, when I started out my graduate, uh, when I did my internship, my graduate work, uh, I interned at the Oklahoma Indian Affairs Commission Okay, which represented the tribes. And then all of a sudden, politically in Oklahoma, that was disbanded. You know, now we have one person representing all the tribes inside the governor's office. When, it, when originally it was all the tribes where you, you know, had a, had a, could nominate someone that was going to inter uh, interrelate with the legislature. And the current, leg the current political system in Oklahoma said, you know, under Fallon said, we're not going to do that anymore. And so it's like, the one mechanism for tribes and the state to negotiate with is, is gone. And so I've often wondered if tribes need to fund that ourselves or, or what, because the, uh, and the reason that the Oklahoma Indian Affairs Commission probably uh, was effective is because you started dealing with the Potawatomi case on tobacco, you know, and then you start dealing with uh, other, other, Supreme, other Supreme Court cases. So policy 
in this state. I think, I think we'll probably swing back again. The tribes will have some input, but I don't know. I just don't. I, I'm, I'm never hopeful because it's, you know, it's money. I wanted to speak to your question. And, um, oh, sorry. No, you're fine. I, I just was waiting for a pause so I could add something because I don't want to take away from your guys' time. Uh, well, I was going to speak to the question of the, the Palestinian lady. I'm sorry, what's your name? Nadia, I'm a, I'd like to speak to your question. Like, I'm, a, I'm not to get too kumbaya, but I, I'm multiracial, and I love it when races come together because we do achieve more together than we do individually. With the school name change, we changed one of the elementary schools from Jackson to Unity. Unity. Yes. And Jackson was no friend of the Indians. And so it was a coming together of white people, African Americans, Native Americans to affect these changes. Um, and all it took all of us working together to accomplish that. And I, that was very heartening, and I loved seeing that. And I, I, that's part of what Tri-City Collective tries to do, is bring people together. Uh, but yeah, that was a great moment of an example of races coming together to accomplish a huge goal and winning. Mm -hmm. So, OK, you had a question? No, I said in the future. No. No. As a matter of fact, uh, the state of Sequoia was actually uh, dominated by, uh, because the Creeks, uh, the Creeks, Choctaws, Cherokees actually were hiring teachers that were from the states because we could not provide enough in our colleges. I'm, it was when I was doing my history on that. No. When I was talking about the state of Sequoia, I'm talking about, uh, you're talking about politics and about, uh, we're talking about control, right? Ultimately. And when, I'm, when I address that issue, what I'm talking about is it's, it, the negotiation is always one-sided. And so it's like, when, uh, it's like when Governor Fallon did away with the Oklahoma Indian Affairs Commission. There was a body there that was going to negotiate on behalf of tribes. Does that make sense? There was a conversation politically. And, that, and so now it's, it's one-sided again. It's, it's turned one-sided, and so... I, I feel like the tribes are going to respond to it well. I, I think that they're going to gain support. Uh, but the issue is, is that you have sovereignties here that have been here for a long time. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, the Cherokees are supposed to have a delegate in, in Congress. All right? That's by treaty. Yeah. So are the Lenape. It's in the Delaware's very first treaty as well. And the fact that it's taken until, what, what year is this, 2019? Before those tribe, before the Congress is even addressing that? I mean, the Virgin Islands has representatives. I mean, uh, I mean uh, Puerto Rico. And I'm not diminishing Puerto Rico's representation in Congress. They have a non-voting re representation, but it's there. And I think it's, it's been long past time for there to be a delegate inside Congress that represents uh, tribal interests. On the same token, because the Creeks were really good at their confederacy, they had House of Kings and House of Warriors, the tribe should have a delegate inside the state of Oklahoma legislature. I mean, that's all there is to it. And it's not, not, we shouldn't be celebrating someone like Ben Carson, who, re, who is a member of our tribe, it gets to be our representative, and therefore it's all covered. There should actually be someone that's, that, that is from the tribe that, that, that represents the, the tribal nations. And the culture, and that's definitely not Mark Wayne Mullen. Okay. And so, does that make sense? Okay, so we're not, we're not talking about kicking out or including. It's just, can we be part of the process now? That's correct. Right. Like, one of the f funny things is that the Congress apologized to 
the kingdom of Hawaii. Right? Were you aware of that? Okay. Right. And so, but they actually issued an apology to the kingdom of Hawaii for taking it over. Because they were under a, they were under a, a flag of, 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 uh, of allies, right? The United States was allies with the kingdom of Hawaii, supposedly, as was Britain. We, we still haven't gotten an apology to the tribes of Oklahoma from Congress. Does that make sense? So it is 4 <laughs> o'clock. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. Does, uh, it, does that make sense? No, well, well, I'm very skeptical that we will ever get an apology. Anyways, there we go. I'm just, so it, inclusion in the political process and not just by, uh, not just by, uh, uh, we're lucky if we get Mark Wayne Mullen. <laughs> so four o'clock, thank you to everybody for being a part of this. Uh, please give... The panelists, a round of applause. I think they did an awesome job. In addition to being hilarious and funny, they're also very smart and informative. So thank you guys very much. That was awesome. And thank you guys for showing up. This, is, this was great. We've got a real talk coming up in December. It's about women in leadership roles and how um, the challenges they're facing now are that they have some leadership positions, well, more than they did 50 years ago, new challenges facing and the same old challenges that persist. So please join us then as well. Uh, follow us at tricitycollective.com uh, or on Facebook and Instagram for more events. Thanks, thanks for coming, everybody.